Keeping with the um, theme of today, I thought that I would start by giving you a bit of an overview of what, what I think some of the impacts of internet and some of the next generation networks in higher education are having on research productivity uh, around the country and the world. I think you know, the first uh, impact that you need to keep in mind is that these uh, new networks, new next generation networks, are providing more orders of magnitude or hundredfold increases in bandwidth capacity over current generation networks. And that uh, can have a significant impact on applications. Secondly, that they're providing some very advanced sorry, communication what? tools and collaborative opportunities yes. between yes. researchers around the world. Yes. Thirdly, they're enabling some very ambitious large-scale next-generation projects and applications to support fundamentally new research models. And that's a, a very important impact. And all of these collectively are, are beginning to reshape some of the uh, federal funding policies that favor diverse collaborative research paradigms. So these are all, I think, uh, starting with uh, what we view as some of the very important impacts of these next-generation networks in higher education. Let's uh, take a moment to look at uh, what, what are some of the emerging national trends in support of advanced research infrastructure. And you've heard some of these topics referred to earlier today, some various themes that are emerging. And what is this uh, notion of high performance grid computing is having a very important uh, impact or is an important need for very high end grid computing? Uh, some of our uh, prior presenters have talked about these huge data repositories, the volume of data that's being collected that needs to be analyzed, and these uh, shared grid computing architectures are having a uh, are becoming an important national trend. You heard uh, reference to the Terra Grid and some other projects, and we're also looking at a, a project with Sun Microsystems here in New Jersey. Uh, a second important emerging trend has to do with optical networking. Uh, Internet 2 and the National Land Rail. I'll have a lot more to say about this in a few moments, but optical networks are giving us the ability to provide terabits to the desktops at hundredfold increases over the, the capacity of current networks. <clears throat> a third emerging trend is this uh, trend towards large scale network attached storage supporting federated research repositories. And we're, we're beginning to see that change in some of the federal funding models to develop these shared repositories of uh, volumes of data that can be accessed very quickly over high-speed networks. And again, this notion of being able to provide uh, terabits to the desktop in a very fast form. It's changing the nature of even the compute device on your desktop. And lastly, is this um, we're beginning to see the emergence of very advanced data visualization capabilities that are capable of supporting 100 plus megapixel displays. And it's really the, the bringing together of these very uh, various elements that constitute cyber infrastructure. Uh, and it's a theme that you've heard throughout the day. Um, this map is a kind of an overview of two of the major advanced research networks that exist today. In red is the Internet 2 group, what's called the Appling Backbone across the United States. And in blue, you see the National Land Rail. And these are the two major uh, optical uh, research networks within the state of New Jersey, but also within the, the United States. What's also important to keep in mind is that both of these very high speed infrastructures are also uh, worldwide and international in scope. So, for instance, Internet 2 peers with well over 44 countries around the world and make it possible for us to build global collaboration communities around the planet. And they're you know, accessible at very high speeds through video conferencing as well as shared computing environments. Uh, similarly, the National Land Rail is also internationally connected. And we're finding that many countries are beginning to interconnect optical research networks to form a global super network. In this case, it's being called uh, GLIP, or the, or the Global Land Integrated Facility. And these are very fast networks. I mean, National Land Rail uh, is much faster in some ways than Internet 2. I frequently ask, you know, what are some of the advanced network application attributes associated with these new research networks? And I think two things come to mind. One is this notion of interactive collaboration, and that's uh, a very distinguishing attribute of, of next generation applications. 
And secondly, is this notion of real-time access to remote resources. And what's beginning to happen is we're taking a lot of scientific instrumentation and we're plugging it into the network so that it can be controlled in real time from remote locations. It also presents the ability to gather data from around the world and bring it back to a single data visualization or simulation. Very powerful. So creating a new kind of science that didn't exist before. Um, some of the technology we're looking at today uh, you know, is, is creating what are called group-to-group -group collaborations. So there's a, uh, an initiative called the Access Grids where researchers from around the world are creating these rooms where they can have uh, new kinds of collaboration and lots of tools that didn't exist before. Not only bringing people together uh, from around the world, but well as you know, data visualization, shared whiteboards, uh, and they're really experimenting with all kinds of things. There's well over 150 of these sites around the country today, uh, and it's growing uh, all the time. And JIT has recently purchased two access grids at the school. When I first heard about the National Land Rail, I wanted to learn a little bit more about what kinds of applications could be enabled as a result of this very fast new network. And I had an opportunity to meet with uh, Professor Larry Smart at the University of California, San Diego. He's previously associated with the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. <clears throat> and he kind of knocked my socks off with some of what they were doing with remote instrumentation. And what uh, he was doing in, his, in California was basically engaging in brain imaging collaboration between UCSD as well as the rest of the UC system and was interacting with Osaka, Japan, which has the most powerful electron microscope in the world. And they were doing you know, research in brain imaging and bringing it all the way back open, in high definition and being able to create these uh, distributed collaboration environments uh, around the UC system, including UC Irvine as well as UC San Diego. And, <clears throat> This enhanced collaboration was using high definition digital video directly over the National Land Rail to create this notion of a collaboratory, which is a, a new word in science today. But bringing all of these together in essentially real time is pretty exciting. Um, and this is an example, it's called a GeoWall 2. And I had referred to in a prior slide the need for you know, very powerful grid computers to take volumes of data stored in some of the uh, federated research repositories. There's a huge amount of data that's being collected from the brain imaging experiments and going into a very large data repository and it's all got to be crunched in real time to produce this uh, very impressive uh, data visualization. Well, you need, you, know, you need some hardware to do that and you need some sophisticated data visualization capabilities. And that's what's you know, driving some of the forefront of science these days and creating these new <clears throat> distributed collaboratories. While I was out there, we also had a chance to take a look at what were some of the capabilities that were involved in the next generation of research PCs that's on the horizon. What we saw is, again, this theme of that we really need to provide terabits to the desktop. We need to get them there very fast. Um, we need these 100 plus megapixel displays. In this case, it was a, a graphics processor that could spread the image across 55 flat panel displays to produce a single image across that to do very high-end data visualization. Um, these new next generation research PCs are going to need about a third of a terabit per second I.O. throughput in order to meet the allocation demands and challenges that exist. Uh, they'll also need about a quarter of a teraflop of CPU capacity. And they're estimating that these uh, <clears throat> machines will need about an eighth of a terabit byte of RAM as well as 60 terabytes of disk in order to do the job. So you can see we're going to, you know, there's like a freight train headed our way with some, you know, very advanced computational requirements that are going to uh, be needed to support the research, adequately support the research community. Um, so kind of in summary, what are some of the benefits of these advanced, advanced research networks? Uh, number one is collaboration opportunities with global communities and working groups around the world. Uh, increased opportunities for grant dollars. Clearly, some of the message we heard that the, there's a reshaping of federal funding policies to favor diverse collaborative research uh, initiatives. Uh, <clears throat> the ability to tap into remote expertise and experiences. The ability to provide terabits to the desktop, as well as the ability to bring the world into the classroom. 
So these are just kind of a summary of taking a look at uh, what are some of the uh, impacts of advanced research networks in higher education. So what about New Jersey? What are some current plans in New Jersey? <clears throat> NDA is currently planning a next generation regional optical network that will support global collaborations and allow New Jersey researchers to successfully compete for federal research funding. Uh, we're working closely in collaboration with the New Jersey President's Council to develop a research agenda for the state that will provide advanced technology infrastructure that supports research and development opportunities between academia and industry. We firmly believe that this next generation infrastructure is needed to both stimulate the economy and provide New Jersey with a competitive advantage. All right, now a little bit about NJ Edge. Who are we? Um, NJ Edge is a statewide higher education network. We're part of New Jersey's plan for higher education. And we provide a private high performance network infrastructure that spans the entire state of New Jersey. And we currently have about 53 college and university members that uh, connect to this private network. We're essentially created for two reasons uh, or purposes. One was we were created to support new forms of interinstitutional collaboration as well as joint degree programs between institutions. And secondly, we were created to leverage the collective buying power of the membership to achieve economies of scale. And we've been rather successful in doing that. <clears throat> this slide uh, diagrammatically uh, depicts how NJN is currently connected to Internet 2. And this is our, our last generation uh, network infrastructure. But you can see in the center of this diagram, there's a what we call an aggregation router that's uh, stored at Rutgers University that captures all of the uh, packets that are destined for Internet 2. And it sort of comes into one regional aggregation point. And that very thick purple line that's uh, going to Magpie, Magpie is our Internet 2 service provider. Uh, that's our gateway, if you will, out to Internet 2. So this shows how you know, across the state we regionally aggregate all the traffic uh, to get destined for Internet 2. We're currently in the process of uh, moving forward with the next generation architecture for NJS. And what you see in the center of this diagram is a uh, sort of an optical core, a core ring that's uh, based on fiber optics that really connects the northern part of the state to the southern part of the state. And in Newark at a Carrier Hotel on Halsey Street, as well as a secure <coughs> location in Camden, we have some very large aggregation routers. Uh, we'll also have a presence at a Carrier Hotel in Philadelphia. It's actually where Magpie is located, uh, at 401 North Broad Street. And the member universities will have a variety of options for connecting into the core of our network. Uh, they can come with um, ATM circuits. They can come with uh, what's called switched Ethernet circuits, or they can come with direct fiber. But what's important from, from our perspective is that the, the core of NJS will be an optical ring that will be operating at um, you know, upwards of 10 gigabits per second. So it will be a much faster <coughs> core infrastructure. And this is sort of a more detail about the ring. I don't plan to go into all of this, but um, this is how we light the fiber. But what we envision is over time, is that uh, members and groups of members will have ringlets off this core ring where we will uh, also be able to upgrade the speeds out on the last mile to the campuses. So we'll have, uh, over time, a larger uh, series of rings that are interconnected to support the higher education community. What are some of the advantages of this new architecture and design? We're going to see about a 230% increase in bandwidth capacity. And given the application demands that I've talked about, that's going to be desperately needed. Uh, to support some of those research requirements, um, there just isn't enough capacity in the connections that each of the institutions have today. So we need to see this uh, increase that's cost effectively provided by using fiber optics. Um, in the new design, because of removing the core of the network into what's called a carrier hotel, We'll have access to national optical networking initiatives such as the National Lambda Rail, as well as some of the federated research repositories that will be existing on those networks. Um, they'll be directly accessible from where we're placing our core aggregation routers. Uh, second is we'll have access, we'll be providing our members with access to some high-end grid computing. There's a project uh, with Sun Microsystems and uh, loosely affiliated with uh, Magpie that will provide grid cycles for our members. 
We also have uh, new opportunities for disaster recovery with that excess capacity. It turns out that SunGuard happens to reside at, you can interconnect with at 401 North Broad, which is a carrier hotel. So without any circuits, with just the core architecture that we're building, we can have a free cross-connect to provide our campuses with various disaster recovery options. Anywhere from just providing safe off-site storage and full business continuity resumption. Uh, what are some of the uh, NJH network resources that we provide for our members? We're essentially the broadband internet service provider for our members, and collectively the membership has about 900 megabits of internet bandwidth that we, we procure for them. And this is an example of an economy of scale, because we're buying almost a gigabit's worth of internet bandwidth, we can get the, cut the price in half for what each school would pay individually on their own. Uh, we also, in the core of the network, provide some very sophisticated video conferencing and distance learning capabilities. We have a MCU, or multi-point conferencing unit, that's capable of supporting upwards of several hundred simultaneous video conferences anywhere in the state of New Jersey with multiple participating sites. So we've invested about a million, million bucks in, a, in an MCU that, uh, to further the goals of our members. Uh, we provide streaming video resources. Uh, we provide interoperability with the K-12 community. They have a, a video portal in K-12 that's called Access New Jersey, and we directly have a gigabit link between our MCU and their MCU so that we can support, we get access to those eyeballs, uh, if you will. And there's a lot of um, state-mandated teacher recertification requirements, for instance, that many of our higher ed departments of education directly support, so rather than making them travel to our campuses, we can deliver that education directly on the premises of the high school. Uh, we provide shared access to a satellite uplink downlink, rather than each institution paying about uh, half a million bucks for satellite uplink downlink, by plugging one into the core of the network, it becomes a shared resource for all the members. Anyone that has a, a broadband connection into the network can originate broadcast quality video in real time uh, out of that uplink and all, as well as receiving. And we provide peering and exchange points with, with other, other networks. This, kind of, this diagram illustrates, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but what our video network basically looks like. Uh, we have an extranet in the core and up in the upper uh, left-hand corner is that video portal where we have MCUs, gateways, and streaming servers. Um, we can originate uh, <clears throat> and send ISDN if that gateway service is provided, as well as we have this uh, connection to the Access New Jersey K-12 video portal. And uh, a lot of good things happen. Up in the upper right-hand corner, you can see that there's a, uh, this shared satellite uplink downlink for the membership. And that has a uh, terrestrial microwave gateway connection direct to NJN television, so that you can actually broadcast from any of your campuses direct to NJN, and let's say the governor were here for the day, if you wanted to not have a crew come out here, <clears throat> you could do it locally. What are some of the, uh, those were resources, but what are some of the capabilities of the network? Uh, I mentioned that one of the reasons we were created was to support new forms of interinstitutional collaboration and statewide applications. And we've had a beginning to see the emergence of some new joint degree programs between institutions. For instance, uh, Ramapo College had a, a local need requirement that we're getting a lot of demand for a nursing program. So were they to hire a lot of expensive nursing faculty to do that? Well, they, they forged a relationship with the University of Madison and Dentistry. And they put together uh, a degree program that's taught in Ramapo, and it looks like a Ramapo degree, but it's really offered by faculty. Um, from UNDNJ. Uh, and we have other examples around the state, and we, we need to encourage a lot more of this. We, everything from shared colloquia, where the, uh, a physicist at Princeton University can, you know, can be sat in by physics departments around the state. Uh, and we, we host many of our own teams using video conferencing. We even, there's a lot of mundane uh, type things, like the state colleges and universities, the CFOs today are meeting using our uh, video conferencing. They basically decided to buy everybody a little H.323 video codec, and then the CFOs are meeting uh, using our bridging service. Um, resource sharing, expertise and equipment. These are some of the interinstitutional collaboration opportunities, and we're, we're beginning to see a bit more of that. 
uh, coordinated professional development. We have a very active distance learning academic advisory board where faculty are focusing on best practices and in integrating technology into the curriculum. Uh, uh, we're coordinating some of that professional development of faculty around the state. Uh, all in all, we're you know, seeking to create optimal environments to support teaching and learning. Uh, we have a video on demand caching initiative where we'll be able to store video on demand and link it to Blackboard and WebCT so that along with the course you can directly have a link to a video on demand with a playlist where you take little segments of video and integrate that with your instruction. Uh, so this is something that we pro provide in the core of NJS from an applications environment. Um, and new opportunities for research collaboration. I'll have more to say about that in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> from the very beginning, with the creation of NJX, there was always this notion of trying to extending the reach of the higher education community to new populations of learners. And that includes off-campus learners, K through 12, as well as corporate and community constituents. <clears throat> and um, to support research and development partnerships with industry. This is something that we haven't I've gone after in a big way, but as part of our strategic plan in the coming year, uh, we're going to try to provide some linkages between uh, industry and academia on the research front. Um, efficiencies and economies of scale. How, how have we been efficient in achieving part of our mission to create economies of scale? Well, we've done this in certainly in internet as well as voice services. You know, we did a survey of all of our members and found that when it came to long distance telephony, there was over 30 million minutes a year. Well, you can commit that volume of minutes to a vendor. We were able to drive the cost of long distance down to under two cents a minute. And many of our members were paying six or eight cents a minute. Uh, so that's a huge savings for many of our members. But again, it's this notion of leveraging the collective buying power of our members to achieve economies of scale. And internet, uh, in our new architecture, we're driving the cost down to about $52 per megabit. And that'll be UUNet, which is premium tier one internet, because we're buying a gigabit's worth of internet to be able to offer to our members at $52 a gig, which is very cost effective compared to their purchasing it on their own. Uh, particularly the smaller schools get a big benefit here because they may only have 10 or 20 megs of internet that they need, but by being part of a consortium, they're able to get a much better price. Uh, we also support a variety of uh, statewide software site licensing agreements with a, a number of vendors. And, Probably we'll do something with Microsoft in the very near future. Um, we have a whole new uh, surge of interest in joint statewide application services. We have a task force that's working on a uh, statewide help desk proposal where each institution would be able to select from a menu whether you want support from Blackboard, you want support from FCT. This is uh, many schools really want this sort of help desk for after hours. You know, who's there when this institution closes? If students take a distance learning course at 2 o'clock in the morning and they need help, where do they go? Well, uh, a school could elect to just have it on you know, evenings and weekends, or they could have it all the time. And we found that in, we have a task force that's analyzing the needs and requirements of our members to have a statewide, and we have three vendors that we're going to do a bid with statewide. Um, <clears throat> basically a, a statewide consortium bid for help desk and uh, we'll see how that turns out. But we've been in the process of identifying what are all the applications that institutions want supported. Disaster recovery has been a big one. Uh, again, more for the IP managers. But what we'll be able to do now that we have an increase in capacity about 230%, you can take some of that increase now and use it for disaster recovery and do it very cost effectively because the site that will have those large disk repositories is on the core ring, optical ring. Uh, I mentioned video on demand. This is something that has gotten a lot of interest in the library community. In fact, we held a meeting last summer. We had over uh, 50 people showed up for the meeting, and they're all uh, licensing video content from companies like Films Media Group, which is the largest supplier of uh, academic video. It's not entertainment video, but uh, things that are libraries or are licensing. We looked at they produced uh, a listing of every one of our members that's currently paying for a license. And we figured out that if NJ Edge caches the video content into a digital library and makes it, and they don't have to serve it up, that's Films Media Group, there's going to be about a million dollar a year savings to the libraries in the state of New Jersey because we're able to cache it, and it's a hierarchically, we'll cache it down to campus caches. Uh, 
Uh, so that's a pretty exciting project. We think we've got a, a very close to hearing about a grant uh, to support that. Um, I mentioned large-scale network attached storage being something that um, everyone needs, and you certainly heard as a theme today. Uh, and <clears throat> again, it's getting our research community into the mode of sharing very expensive scientific instrumentation. This is something that will play very well in China at a time when uh, funding is very tight, rather than taking a remote scanning electron microscope and have it buried on a single campus. Let's plug it into the network and share it among uh, multiple institutions. Uh, there's an example of a uh, stellar observatory on one campus that um, <clears throat> they're getting an NSF grant to put a digital front end on so it could be completely controlled in real time by a web browser. So we're very excited about that. Question? Yeah. How would the reason that we should do that um, right now? How do we handle it? Like, uh, if, if you're doing a project that needs the electron microscope or whatever, how would you find out which ones are our patients and what else we go out there and we can access them? Very good question. Uh, this is a service that we'll be supporting from our website. I'll, I'll show you later. I'm going to, uh, later in the presentation, I'm going to talk about suggestions I have, particularly for just a research interest that you have. Uh, forming basically a new group that focuses just on support of the research community. And there'll be an opportunity for you to participate in that. But uh, <clears throat> basically at the NGA website, which I'll show it later, um, we provide sort of comprehensive listing of services that are currently available. All right, another important part of our role is building community around the state. So we spend you know, a lot of our energies trying to build community around the state between member-driven interest groups. So we've organized a variety of statewide working groups around various topics. And they meet every other month. <clears throat> we usually solicit co-chairs from our members. Uh, sometimes we pose agenda items or questions that we'd like feedback on, uh, but they're member-driven uh, support groups. So we have a distance learning academic advisory board, which is very active. And I think in your program, you'll see a listing of some of the um, you know, the current meetings that are being held. Uh, they, they run copyright symposiums, they look at, they bring in outside speakers for what are some best practices in managing campus networks. Um, and they've also, uh, you know, we, they had a faculty best practices showcase recently where we had 30 faculty presenters and uh, about 100 attendees where we had actual faculty presenting in tracks about things that they tried to integrate computing in the curriculum, what's, what has worked, what hasn't worked, uh, and again, it builds community among faculty around uh, technology areas. Uh, that group has also created a subgroup, a coordinated faculty development initiative, uh, which is very active. And they look at, well, we have some schools that are working on how to train faculty in the humanities or in business or in other areas. They said, well, you know, you know, we focus on business or humanities, but they, we'll make that available to other NJH members. And so when we run training events, we'll either use the video conferencing and we'll have four sites when we run these programs. And we tend to get uh, participation rates at about 60 or 80 attendees when we have these events. Uh, and they tend to be almost every other month. Uh, we have an educational activities task force that looks at some of the IT issues and site licensing of software. Uh, how to recruit and retain IT staff. Uh, what are some of the issues? We have a, a data network resources group, people that run campus networks, and we'll have Cisco come in and do uh, workshops on best practices of managing campus networks. We'll run specialized workshops in how to implement quality service across your network or multicast. Um, we have a video and a voice resources group that are looking at you know some video conferencing issues. And, um, you know, what about stuff like, like life-size technology? How are we going to integrate that? Uh, there's some very exciting capabilities with HDTV, and, and what's the right time to integrate that, and what makes sure it's interoperable with other resources that we have. So we're, we have a number of these member-driven groups, and we're very excited. Uh, recently, we created a networking and performing arts initiative. This was, we recently had the opportunity to connect the NJ PAC, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, with fiber optics directly into the NJH core. So they're now connected. Uh, we got a grant from Verizon to provide some video conferencing equipment uh, for them so that they can you know, begin to 
engage in collaborations with performing arts programs among our members, as well as the K-12 community. It's quite interesting that uh, you know, they have a very active and funded K-12 education, things like jazz and teens, let's go to the opera, things like that, but they've always been limited by the school busing day. You know, they could only deal with a 16 mile radius because of school busing and the length of the school day. So now with the video conferencing capabilities and the fact that NJH supports statewide video conferencing, they're now participating in planning programs that will be housed in Camden, New Jersey. Uh, we're going to get a core of schools in Camden that are going to partake of the jazz teams and a couple of the programs that they have. Um, and we're, you know, we've drawn upon some of our members to help them along. This is a new way of teaching when you, when you do it in a video conference. And so how do you, you know, make them feel included in, this, in the video conference? And so uh, we brought some resources to bear to help train them on how to teach effectively over video conferencing. Um, what are some of our next steps? Um, we're currently exploring member interest in creating a research application support group. And this is a, a new area, in addition to the areas that I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> we do have an interest in, in creating a new working group that's specifically to support the research community. And we are planning to recruit and hire an Internet 2 Applications Coordinator to facilitate support of the research community. So I think that will be a, a staffing resource that we can uh, allocate in this regard. We're currently looking to identify a high-profile collaborative research application between several NJH members, and we're, we're seeking that, so if you have any ideas, I'd like to hear about it. Uh, because what we could do is make them a, you know, a high-profile, excellent example of how we can support the research community over the NJH architecture. Um, we've had some discussions, we're starting to plan on providing some hands-on workshops to demonstrate uh, how to interface scientific instrumentation to the network. Uh, we've been studying this problem and we've been looking at some of the emerging standards at, uh, on other statewide networks and so we're looking to provide some hands-on workshops to help get scientific instrumentation connected in the core of the network and so people can start to share. Uh, and I'd like some you know, feedback from, from all of you. Uh, other next steps, uh, I belong to a national organization of state networks and we're collaborate with those other state education, and all, of, all of whom, by the way, are also creating, are in the process of creating regional optical networks. And we're looking at uh, exploring various peering and optical exchange points that are possible. Again, as each state network on its own is developing a regional optical infrastructure, um, there's a lot of interest in looking, how can we get all these state networks to peer with each other? Are we gonna use NLR for that? Um, at the upcoming meeting of the Internet 2 meeting, in, in, uh, it's in Arlington, Virginia, but it's right next to Washington, there's several of us are going to be meeting with folks at the National Science Foundation to talk about seeing if there's any uh, cyber infrastructure funding that could pay to have these optical networks peer with each other because we're the last mile to the researchers that they're trying to get to. So we really should be uh, having more dialogue. Uh, here's some URLs of interest if you want to learn more. Uh, if you want to learn about some of the Internet 2 applications and working groups, it's uh, apps.internet2.edu. There's a lot of working groups and a lot of very exciting areas. Uh, if you're interested in some of them, there's a, uh, a whole wave of K-20 projects that are really very exciting that are taking place. And if you look at uh, k20.internet2.edu slash current projects, you can find out about a lot of things that are going. A lot of they have stuff that you can download and, and work with. Uh, the research channel, if you haven't looked at it, you really should because it's a wonderful compendium of, uh, it's like a, a digital library with a wealth of information that you can directly integrate with your courses, and that's www.researchchannel.org. Uh, I'll certainly make uh, these available to whomever at the end of this presentation. Uh, if you're interested in video, there's a very active group called VidiNet, and uh, they're doing some very exciting things. If you connect to their site, they've got a whole cookbook and stuff you can download and, and start using in, in collaborative ways. Because, you know, Rutgers is connected to Internet, too. I mean, through NJ Edge, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, you should be using it. And uh, hopefully, after this meeting, we can find some perhaps some faculty workshops as a, an approach where we could uh, start doing some things to help you get started. 
Uh, also, virtual briefings. As a campus, you can sign up to get virtual briefings about what, what's happening out on the internet, too. And, you know, again, you don't even have to participate, but you volunteer your campus to be a receive site for a virtual briefing, and then you can invite faculty to come to hear about some of these exciting new projects that are happening out there. And that's events.internet2.edu slash briefings. And you can sit in and just lurk and listen to some of these if you want, but you could also actively participate and ask questions. So, I guess um, one of my, my final message here is to get involved. Uh, talk to your campus OIT support group about the opportunities with NJ Edge and Internet 2, uh, some of these advanced research networks. You can join an Internet 2 working group or a special interest group or advisory group. They're, they're very open, they're very, you know, as a member of NJ Edge, you can easily join and participate. They're very collaborative, uh, collaborative and open to your participation. I mentioned you can host a virtual briefing on your campus. You can join Internet 2 mailing lists to constantly get inundated by these things because they're very active groups indeed. Um, you can learn more about advanced application initiatives in your academic area. And if you go to that application site, you can see how virtually every discipline is listed. And you can see what kind of innovative projects people are collaborating on. Also, I strongly urge you to attend an Internet 2 meeting. It's a meeting April 25th and 26th in Arlington, Virginia. And because of your membership, you get a discount of 10. You can hop on a train and be there two hours, I think. Um, but, I, but I would encourage you to attend. It's just not that far away. You can even go for one day. It would be worth your time and energy, uh, I'm sure. Um, that's about it for me. I'll open up to some questions now. Uh, for more information, here's our website. If you want to learn more directly about NJS. Yes? No, basically uh, all traffic that goes between, let's say, Ramapo and Rutgers, it, it will it will prefer the connection through NJS. We have this private statewide infrastructure that's dedicated to the New Jersey higher education community and because it's an optimal route. It'll be preferred as its connectivity. Yes, yes, because that's the fastest route. The, the metrics of the router sort of know and are able to do an analysis of what's the fastest way to get there, and it will prefer that route. And Internet 2 will be always, even for email, it doesn't have to be a high end research application, it's going to go I2 if it's tested for Caltech. Uh, <clears throat> now, NJ Edge, the NJ Edge private network, is the regional aggregation point for the entire state of New Jersey, so it goes to that aggregation point and then goes out to Internet 2. So we, we provide a regional aggregation for K through 12 as well as higher ed. We do have a number of K through 12 schools that are connected to NJS directly. Uh, this is growing interest from that community uh, accessing internet too. Questions from the other sites? Can't have no questions. In Brunswick? In Brunswick has a question. Have you used um, this? capability um, in terms of the performing arts and master classes whereby the master is in a location in another part of the country and the students are someplace in New Jersey. Uh, we have not directly uh, done master classes as of yet. Our hope is that we can bring the folks at NJ Pack along a little bit more. They're a little intimidated by the technology right now. We've actually enlisted the support of the Manhattan School of Music, which has been uh, very active in this uh, arena. And they've had several video conferences with the folks at NJPAC to try to help you know, bring them along and make them a little bit more comfortable. But uh, I'm also excited to uh, report that we are also having discussions now with the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra, which also uses the NJPAC performance spaces. And uh, we're, we're very interested in getting uh, them a grant as well. But, um, we would like to uh, <clears throat> solicit more participation from some of the performing arts programs of our members, uh, like Rutgers, 
uh, to see if they would be interested in getting together with the folks at NJPAC to foster and facilitate some of these uh, master classes and other opportunities. So I'd be happy to follow up with you on that if you'd like. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you all very much.